heard that those white streaks we see crisscrossing the sky are part of a secret government experiment to control the population. Is that true? <laughs> the chemtrail conspiracy theory is exactly that, a conspiracy theory. But like all good conspiracies, this one started with a grain of truth. Back in the 1950s, weather modification was all the rage. Sometimes rain doesn't fall in dry areas, not because there isn't enough water vapor, but because there aren't enough dust particles that form the nuclei of raindrops for that vapor to start condensing around and form rain. So when scientists at General Electric in upstate New York figured out that by seeding clouds with condensation nuclei, they could make it rain, well, that was a game changer. Small planes would be sent up to spray silver iodide particles into likely clouds over small areas, sometimes causing rain or snow to fall from those clouds. Over the years though, it became obvious that the cost of the seeding far outweighed the benefits of the rain that resulted. So most places stopped. Interestingly, one of the last holdouts was the Canadian River Basin right here in my corner of Texas. They were still doing it up until about a year or two ago, as far as I know. But even if these experiments were limited and temporary, word about them still got out. Strange planes spraying silvery looking powder had been spotted by people who didn't realize what they were doing and why they were up there doing it. That's why even now, decades later, people confuse ordinary condensation trails or contrails with so-called chemtrails. Those white streaks we see in the sky they're contrails, but what they are and where they come from is no secret. Contrails form after jetliners have passed overhead. Little bits of pollution, dust and soot from their engines, act as nuclei for water vapor to condense around, forming these long ribbon-like clouds. And it's true that contrails can look pretty funky. They can linger in the sky for hours after planes have passed, and they can be stretched out and blown sideways by the wind. Multiple planes crossing in different directions can create these crisscross patterns. Scientists still actively study contrails, but despite all the conspiracies that you can find on the internet, contrails are perfectly normal. They are not part of any kind of secret government experiment, and although they do have a small effect on climate, they're definitely not the main reason why the planet is warming. Okay, so if those strange stripes we see in the sky aren't some secret military experiment, does that mean that geoengineering isn't real? No, geoengineering is very real, although it's not yet practiced much. But it doesn't involve imaginary chemtrails, although it can involve some of the same physics that we see in real contrails. What exactly is geoengineering? It's simply the idea of engineering the Earth or changing something that would affect the entire planet, like the climate. So in the broadest sense of the word, Burning fossil fuels to produce enormous amounts of heat trapping gases that cause the planet to warm could be a type of geoengineering, although a very accidental one. Today, scientists define geoengineering much more narrowly as a deliberate, not accidental, large scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems specifically to counteract climate change. Geoengineering can be very simple. Did you know that planting trees on a massive enough scale is actually a type of geoengineering? That's because trees take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, reducing the impact of human emissions. But of course, geoengineering can also be incredibly high tech. For instance, you could set up massive arrays of mirrors in space that could be tilted to shade us from just the right amount of energy from the sun that we need to cool the earth or prevent it from warming. Some geoengineering experiments have already been conducted on a very small scale. For example, scientists have known for a long time that adding iron to iron poor areas of the ocean can stimulate plankton growth, which in turn takes up carbon. In 2012, a US businessman convinced a Haida Nation village in Canada to pay him to dump iron into the ocean near their village, arguing that it would increase local salmon populations and they could sell the carbon credits too. No one found out about this until after he had illegally dumped about 120 tons of iron sulfate into the ocean. And there is no evidence that it accomplished anything. 
But the most famous, or perhaps infamous, type of geoengineering is what's known as Solar Radiation Management, or SRM. This is the method that shows the most potential for limiting the planet's warming. As it's relatively affordable, especially compared to the costs of unchecked warming, and it can be carried out with currently available technology and materials. Solar radiation management is the idea of cooling down the Earth by increasing the amount of sunlight that gets reflected back to space. One way to do this would be to inject massive amounts of soot or dust into the upper atmosphere, where they would circle the planet for months and even years, mimicking the effects of a massive volcanic eruption. Another method is similar to the weather modification we talked about from the 1950s. But this time, cloud condensation nuclei, which could be something as simple as sea salt, would be sprinkled in areas over the ocean to increase the amount and the brightness of marine clouds. Both of these approaches would create a reflective surface, like the mirrors except a lot cheaper, that would reflect the sun's energy back to space. The good thing is that these methods could be relatively adjustable. You could start small and then ramp them up, dialing in exactly how much cooling we need. There have been a lot of modeling studies that demonstrate its effectiveness. And the first real world, but extremely small scale experiment is going to be launched sometime this next year by scientists from Harvard, using a high altitude balloon over Arizona to spray a very small amount of particles into the atmosphere and observe how effective they are. While geoengineering is not ideal, it's a fix akin to, say, gastric bypass surgery. There's no question that if we continue on our current pathway, we may need it. Badly. Yes, of course it would have been better to live a healthier lifestyle for the last few decades instead of gorging on potato chips and pizza, or in this case, fossil fuels. But if people are in danger today due to our past unhealthy choices, then taking such drastic steps may be justified. We know that drastic steps, however, are far more likely to have unexpected side effects than small measured steps. And so with solar radiation management, there are some serious concerns that we know about, and maybe even some that we don't. First, although solar radiation management may be very effective at controlling global temperature, ocean acidification would continue apace as will other impacts on the biosphere, etc. Second, if this global experiment were ever to stop for whatever reason, the soot and the dust would clear out of the atmosphere in a matter of months to years, meaning that all of that warming it had offset in the meantime would be abruptly realized. The precipitous rise in temperature would be devastating. It absolutely makes sense to study geoengineering to ensure that if we ever need to implement such an extreme measure as deliberately engineering our planet, we know as much as we can about the side effects of the decision ahead of time. But conducting an experiment with the entire planet is like giving the entire human race an experimental drug at the same time. While we may think we know all the potential side effects, until we actually do it at a global scale, we don't. Not for sure. But we do know very well what would happen if we stopped pumping so much carbon into the atmosphere. The warming of the planet would slow, and that would be very good news for all of us. That's why it makes all the sense in the world to reduce our emissions as fast as we can and as soon as we can. Because the more we do now, the less we have to worry about in the future. <laughs>